Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the National World War II Museum's Pearl Harbor Commemoration Ceremony. I'm Stephen Watson, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all tuning in from across the country. Today, on the 79th anniversary of the day that will live in infamy, we remember the 2,403 American civilians and service members who tragically lost their lives as Pearl Harbor was attacked and our country was plunged into war. In keeping with our tradition here at the museum, I'd like to offer a special thank you to our World War II veterans, home front workers, and Holocaust survivors watching today's program. It's our honor to pay tribute to your service every day at the National World War II Museum. I'd also like to recognize all veterans of other eras and active military joining us online. Thank you for your service and for commemorating this special day with us. Additionally, I want to thank the United States Department of Defense for their generous sponsorship of today's ceremony. We're deeply grateful for DOD for their support of not only today's program, but of our programs that continue to mark the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. The tragic events of December 7, 1941, set the stage for arguably the biggest story in human history. And of course, that's the story that we tell here every day at the National World War II Museum. Today, as we remember one of the most defining moments of the 20th century, I'm pleased to share with you an invocation from Rabbi Lexi Erdheim of Congregation Gates of Prayer Synagogue in Metairie, Louisiana. We gather today to engage in the sacred task of Yeast Score, of remembrance, to honor the 2,403 service members and civilians who were killed during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The holy act of remembering is deeply embedded within the American and Jewish traditions. Elie Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor, author, and Nobel Laureate of Blessed Memory, stated prophetically in his memoir Night that to forget would be not only dangerous, but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. We are here to remember not just the number of lives lost, but to remember the individual lives, the individual worlds within that number. The Jewish tradition teaches that every human being is a world unto themselves and that the world was created for each and every person. We mourn and honor every world that was destroyed that day, from enlisted military servicemen to a three-month-old killed at home with her mother and aunt. We pause for a moment of silence to remember these lives cut short. Thank you. Honoring the lives of these individuals feels particularly poignant in this moment, as just this past weekend here in Louisiana, we entered the voting booth and fulfilled our civic duty. It's a reminder that despite attacks on democracy throughout our history, the power of the ballot and the strength of American democracy has remained resolute. In the final days of his life, Moses spoke to the Israelites, who were standing on the precipice of the Promised Land, fearful of the unknown that lay before them. He said to them, Chisku ve'imsu, be strong and resolute. May we too enter into the future with strength and resolution, emboldened and inspired by the memories of those individuals who gave their lives so that we may continue to enjoy liberty, equality, and freedom. Zichronam levracham, may their memories be for a blessing. And together we say, Amen. Our time for your inspiring message of reflection and remembrance. To all of you watching from home, I, I hope you're staying healthy and will be able to come visit us in New Orleans one day soon. 
Um, on your next visit, I encourage you to spend some time in our newest permanent gallery, the Arsenal of Democracy, which features an entire gallery dedicated to the story of the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor and how it helped unite and mobilize our country for a war that we had largely been unprepared for. As you may have noticed, we are once again broadcasting today's ceremony from the Karen H. Bechtel and William M. Osborne III Media Auditorium in our beautiful new Hall of Democracy here at the museum. We are, of course, grateful to be able to leverage the technology, our expert staff, and state-of-the-art facilities here to really continue to serve you, our audiences, from all across the country. I know you all understand the importance of sharing the stories of World War II with audience of all ages, especially students. And I want to thank our World War II Media and Education Center staff, along with our partners at the Pearl Harbor National Memorial for providing free webinars every day last week to fourth through eighth grade classrooms all across the country. Through their efforts, we were able to reach nearly 2,500 students and help them understand why and how the attack on Pearl Harbor happened, and of course, why we continue to remember it today. On that note, to provide some historical context on the significance of the Pearl Harbor attack and how it forever changed our world, I'm now pleased to introduce the museum's own Samuel Zamuri Stone, senior historian, Dr. Rob Satino. As uh, many of you know, Rob is an award-winning military historian, author, and scholar who's published 10 books on World War II history and has been a key member of our staff here for the last four years. And it's really always a great treat to have him share his insights on World War II events and their relevance to our lives today. Dr. Rob Satino. And thank you, Stephen, uh, and hello, everyone out there. I yearn for the day when we can do these events again in person, um, but it's a blessed moment to be together to, to talk about this, uh, this dramatic event in American history. I call this talk not a drill. All of us have experienced dramatic, uh, sometimes even traumatic events in our lives. Things happen to us that seem so unbelievable. We can't process them at first. This isn't happening, we say to ourselves, uh, or this can't be happening. You know, we live in a media-drenched culture in the United States. We practically invented it. And when people ask us about these events, we usually wind up saying something like, it seemed to be happening in slow motion, or I, I thought we were filming a movie. It's happened to all of us, a, a car accident or a fall down the stairs or a kitchen mishap involving sharp knives and boiling water. And the more I think about it, actually, all those things have happened to me at some point or other in my life. The point is this, the, the drama of the moment actually takes us outside ourselves. It's as if we're, we're bystanders watching this horrible thing unfold. We almost become witnesses rather than participants. And that's just the way it was with the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, 79 years ago this very day. The stru sudden strike on Pearl was at first a bewildering, even incomprehensible event. Every single survivor account emphasizes not so much the tactical details of the attack, the number or type of aircraft, their approach, their bearing, as the sheer shock of the attack itself. Strange aircraft appearing out of nowhere, coming on so suddenly that many U.S. sailors thought they were witnessing a particularly realistic exercise or a war game, a simulation of an attack, in other words, rather than the real thing. Well, on came those airplanes, striking, uh, streaking through the early morning Hawaiian sky, swooping down to the attack, launching their deadly payloads, and only then banking back in the, into the heavens to reveal the distinctive symbol on their wings and fuselage, an emblem that soon became known to U.S. aviators as the meatball, a big red circle, the symbol of the rising sun. These were carrier aircraft, all right, but they weren't ours. They were from the Kaigun, the Imperial Japanese Navy, and in the words of a, a famous songwriter, they weren't here to deliver the mail. They had not come in peace. They had come to begin a war. 
It's always struck me that the first radio notification of the attack on Pearl Harbor stressed not the historical details of the event, but the seeming unreality of it all. Air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill, the dispatch read. In other words, air raid on Pearl Harbor, followed by, nope, not kidding, followed by, yes, this is really happening. It really is. And in the first few hours, it wasn't any easier to convince the American public on the home front of the importance of what had just happened. N not that they didn't believe that it had taken place. They, they knew it had taken place. They just didn't know what it meant precisely. Remember, Hawaii wasn't yet a state and wouldn't be for a long time yet until 1959. The last that most Americans heard, if they think about defense issues at all back in the day, the U.S. Pacific Fleet was still berthed at a much more familiar place, San Diego, California. President Roosevelt had moved the fleet out of San Diego into the Pacific to you know, send a message to the Japanese that, that uh, we were serious about our diplomatic demands. There are a number of tales from that day, and, and really they are too many to be dismissed of some young child who heard on the radio that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and then turned to mom or dad and asked, who's she? A as if Pearl Harbor were some friend of the family or some long lost aunt. In the end, of course, Pearl Harbor was all too real and Americans soon realized it. The Japanese attack had caught the country napping and it had hit hard smashing dozens of ships and hundreds of aircraft and killing, unfortunately, thousands of U.S. servicemen. You heard the number a couple times already in this brief presentation, 2,403. Just about half of those dead were the crew of a single U.S. battleship, the USS Arizona, which succumbed to a massive bomb hit on its forward magazine, exploded and rolled over in the opening moments of the attack, one of the worst catastrophes in American military history. The country was at war, as President Roosevelt told the American people the next day. It had been an act of infamy, a crime on the part of the Japanese, and the road ahead, he said, promised to be hard and bloody. It wasn't a nightmare that you wake up from. It was no drill. It was no movie. And it certainly had not happened in slow motion. And so this morning, let us remember the awful reality of Pearl Harbor. Especially those good American citizens who gave their lives in service to our country. Air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. Thank you very much. Now, to continue our programming today, uh, we have a, a special video that has been produced here in-house in the museum by our wizards in the uh, World War II Media and Education Center. I believe it was first produced for the 75th anniversary, but I think it still has a lot to say to us today on the 79th. So if you'll stay now and watch this video. Thank you very much. Hawaii right now might be the island of paradise, but it was a hell of a creation that day and for a couple, three nights. That morning, the sun was out. It was a beautiful day. And then after the first attack, everything turned black. That day was really dark and everything after the, the attack, you know. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Started out no different than the rest. You know, it was a Sunday morning and it was quiet. A lot of ships in the harbor. At 7.55, they sounded general quarters, general quarters, all hands made your battle station. There was five of us in the pay office, 
And I ran to this big porthole we had in the pay office and looked out. And when I looked out, I saw the rising sun on this Kate bomber that had just released its first torpedo for our ship. I, uh, when I saw the rising sun, I hollered out. I said, the Japs are here. When the planes peeled away and I could see the big red Japanese insignia, and I knew it was the Japanese right away, and they were bombing the Fort Island. And you could see them. They came in low and slow. His head looked about that big in the cockpit. That's how close they came to Frisco. They flew right across the bow, heading toward the air station, and the battleships lined up at the moorings. I could see the torpedo planes coming in and the torpedoes in the water. I could see the Pennsylvania over here in Dry Dock and the West Virginia and the Tennessee and the ahead of us and the Nevada behind. And just everybody was getting hit and it was just a very confused situation. And just when I slammed this last dog down on this one door, a torpedo hit the next compartment, hit a fuel tank, sprung the door, and I was completely covered with oil. I turned around and I could see water coming down the second deck ladder hatch. And so I went over and climbed up the ladder and went up on the second deck. And when I got up there, water was already waist high. So I jumped into the water and hid behind this big camel that separated the two battleships. And some of my shipmates came up with me from the third deck and they were already in the water or sitting on the hull because the ship had already had gone over. And that Jap Zero got every one of them. We shook the ship and, uh, you know, 30, 33,600 ton or something like that. It just shook it like you, uh, a dog would just shake a rat or something, you know. It, but, uh, and it blew 110 foot of the bow of the ship off. The Arizona burned for three and a half days after that. A million pounds of ammunition exploded. Aviation gas, fuel oil, just a horrible day. They lost 1177 men on the Arizona. For days after, because it's all patrol, you see body parts. That hurts when you take guys as only 17, 18, 19 years old. A lot of young kids. As the older I get, the, those kind of things stands out in my mind. Well, it's a feeling you, you can't, I can't express. But to know that a lot of your shipmates are still there. When you look at the wall and you can see all the names, you, well, I knew, I knew him, I knew him. He was one of my shipmates. It's tough. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Powerful stories that we will always remember. Once again, I want to express my gratitude to our sponsors at the Department of Defense, to Rob Satino for his remarks, and of course, to our production team here at the museum. And of course, along with all of you who joined us virtually for this special commemorative event. And last, but of course, most importantly, special thank you to our World War II veterans. We know this was a defining day in your lives 79 years ago. And we understand here at the museum the importance of continuing to tell your stories of service and sacrifice for generations to come. I hope all of you joining us today will continue to engage with our online content throughout the day and beyond. Um, also be sure to join us on Wednesday evening for our live webinar with historian Dr. Robert Chester, who will discuss the post-war legacy of Dory Miller, an African-American cook, third class, who was awarded 
the Navy Cross for his defensive actions during the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, that program will begin at 6 p.m. Central and will provide a nuanced look at how the memory of Dory Miller and his heroic actions have evolved in the collective American conscience. So thank you again for joining us today, and I hope to see you at the museum one day very soon. Thank you.